Keep calling you, sir. Colin? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Good. Do I sound like I'm underwater? The microphone on my computer can, can often be pretty poor. Not yet, but it, you know, there's still some time left in the day. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to go on mute until you need okay. me. <laughs>
Hi, everyone. This is Tom Adams. Uh, we're just going to give people a few more minutes. We usually um, are more or less full by about 102 or 103. So just sit tight. We'll get started soon. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us uh, today. Um, I'm Tom Adams, I'm the policy advisor for the Ocean Project and it's great to have uh, so many folks on today. Um, we're gonna spend some time talking about what is going on with Congress and um, uh, on both on the big picture and also on issues that are of concern for zoo and aquarium and museum professionals. Uh, before doing so, I wanna make a couple of uh, announcements. The first is we are grateful for the support from the uh, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, uh, which allows us to, to uh, do these webinars, um, which we do pretty much every first Friday unless there is a holiday that gets in the way, like New Year's, Fourth of July, or whatnot. Um, so we will have one again uh, the first Friday in November, and we we'll look forward to people joining us for that again. Uh, the second is there is a chat and a Q&A function two different functions that'll be on the toolbar. Um, feel free to ask questions or raise points on that. Um, it is being monitored and we'll respond to it uh, in time as we get it. Uh, we also will try to leave some time for questions at the very end. Um, and of course, you can always follow up with us um, afterwards. So let's get started. Um, today, we're going to talk about, um, as I said, what's going on with Congress. Um, Congresses meet for two years. Um, we're almost 10 months into the first year uh, of the Congress. So it is, they're approaching halftime and we'll talk about what's going on uh, between now and the end of the year, appropriations being a big thing. And let me be the first to wish you a happy federal fiscal new year, which was on October 1st. I'm sure I am the first and hopefully the last. Um, we'll also talk about what's going on um, Primarily the change, the big change between this Congress and the last one obviously is that Democrats have taken control of the House 
uh, with a completely different uh, agenda and a proactive agenda in terms of conservation. So we'll talk uh, about what's going on there. Um, then we're delighted to have Colin Sheldon with uh, WCS with us. Uh, Colin was on an earlier webinar um, and he's gonna talk about some things that they're working on uh, that are really exciting and offer some great opportunities for conservation work. And then we'll finish up uh, with some bigger um, picture things that will hopefully put everything in context. So here we go. That'll be the shortest slide on the presentation. So um, where we are right now is, you know, impeachment is beginning to take up, uh, get some momentum and get some steam and it will consume more and more oxygen for the next month or two, um, probably through the rest of the year. Um, and it will cloud out uh, other things that are going on in terms of the amount of attention it gets. Uh, two things that won't get attention, which um, need it desperately, are immigration reform and infrastructure. Um, those are uh, wedge issues. There was never really a shot at them this Congress, which is unfortunate because they're so desperately needed. Um, what does have to happen every year is the third bullet point, which are appropriations bills. Um, the federal fiscal new year, as I mentioned, begins on October 1st in theory. The 12 appropriations bills that Congress passes or are responsible for passing are supposed to be done and signed into law now. Um, they've missed that target for about 20 years now, and they operate under something called a continuing resolution, which the news a lot of time will call a stopgap funding bill, which they have passed, and it expires on November 21st. So they fought themselves about six weeks. Uh, and they are working on it, and we'll get into a little bit of it um, shortly in terms of some of the accounts that may be of interest uh, to people who work at zoos and aquariums. Uh, and then, um, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll get into the uh, shortly into the uh, what's going on with the resources committee. But the main thing there is climate change, which was the issue which shall not be uh, spoken of for the first two years of the Trump administration is suddenly a focal point of virtually everything that the Natural Resources Committee is doing on the House side. Um, as I mentioned, big picture bills aren't moving, but smaller bills like the ones Colin's gonna talk about um, are getting considered and they are moving and we'll put that in a context. And then the backstop on everything is the Senate is basically a graveyard for a lot of legislation. Uh, the priority of uh, majority leader is confirming judges and that's getting, pri that's getting precedent and priority. And so it's creating a bit of a legislative bottleneck uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, and some of the future slides. So um, without further ado, uh, appropriations. There are three bills that are of primary importance uh, for zoos and aquariums. They all, uh, um, that, and the accounts I'm gonna highlight are all opportunities for grant funding. There's obviously a bunch of other great programs in terms of uh, conservation um, but when I worked at Brookfield Zoo, we tapped into several of these for our um, work. And so I encourage you to look into them. Um, as you can see on all of these numbers, the House numbers are gonna be bigger than the Senate and the Senate numbers are virtually um, across the board in all these accounts larger than the administration's uh, proposal. Um, and you'll see in a couple of the italics in the bottom of the next couple of slides, the administration really sought to zero out and eliminate and restrict funds um, and the Congress is basically ignoring that. A good example of that are these two NOAA education programs, which are not big ticket items. Um, as you can see, it's you know not much more than uh, 15 million on the high end for the uh, on the House numbers for these two. But then the administration basically were cutting these programs to the point where they could pay for staff, but really not have anything to fund. So this is good news. It shows strong support for Congress. And I encourage you, uh, if you want to learn more about these programs, um, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information will be on the last slide. Um, then finally, I put the marine debris program in there because an awful lot of you are working on plastics from either an education perspective or maybe even getting involved in, uh, in campaigns at state and local level. Uh, the marine debris program is the main program for that at the federal level. Um, it's not really that much money, um, but it's really sort of hard to find a federal role for all of this, um, other than maybe at some point being able to pry some more money loose um, and have that leveraged 
from other sources. Um, then finally, on the it's it's odd the labor, health, and education appropriations is where the Institute for Museum and Library Services are from. Uh, zoos and aquariums have tapped into this um, as well as science museums uh, every year. And every year, the IMLS hands out what they call a medal, which recognizes great programs. And every year, at least one to two zoos and aquariums seem to be getting the award. As you can see, this is another program that Congress ignored uh, the administration's efforts to eliminate the program. So that's it with appropriations. Now I mentioned the House Natural Resources Committee um, is the primary committee of jurisdiction for land, water, and wildlife and oceans. Um, and in the Senate, the jurisdiction is split. But as I mentioned earlier, um, they're aggressively moving on climate change. They, they've um, they pass legislation out of committee and are moving it to and through the floor to make climate change something that is a factor that's considered in virtually every land and water uh, regulation bill uh, that's out there, um, which is would be very important and very helpful. Um, the House, uh, week before a couple weeks ago on September 12th, uh, basically passed legislation, three bills, uh, bipartisan bills to uh, ban offshore oil and gas drilling virtually everywhere where it's not already occurring, um, which would basically be in the Gulf Coast uh, off Louisiana, from Louisiana, Texas. Um, they're also, you, you hear an awful lot about subpoenas and not being complied with, um, particularly as it relates to impeachment and the Mueller probe, but this is happening with virtually every House committee that's trying to figure out how decisions are getting made. In the case of the Interior Department, you have a bunch of former uh, lobbyists for oil and gas and timber and mining that are in senior positions and they keep making decisions to benefit their old clients. Uh, and the committee's trying to get to the bottom of this. They're getting stonewalled. Um, but all of this sort of, you know, leads back to, um, you know, the bigger picture of the Congress exercising its oversight authority. Um, and, it, you know, impeachment's part of that and everything else. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I mentioned Mitch McConnell, as you see in the bottom bullet on the Senate side, on the right side, uh, is controlling the Senate schedule. But one of the things that Democrats in the House are trying to do is to prove, as you, you hear them say, they can walk and chew gum at the same time, which means they can pursue impeachment and they can pass legislation. They've done an awful lot of that on issues that voters care about, um, but I will say they've done a terrible job of messaging it. Um, but they continue to work on that and sort of that's going to be the dynamic that goes forward, certainly for the rest of the year. Um, as I mentioned, uh, these are very important bills. I worked on this issue when I was a congressional aide beginning in the EGAD's 1980s. Um, and I would say that the, the support for this, for banning oil drilling in these areas, um, reaches the level it was at when I worked on this issue where the, it was basically a non-starter in a lot of states for about 20 or 30 years. Um, the Senate's not expected to act on these bills, but the one thing I'll say is if you are interested in coastal issues, offshore oil and gas drilling has brought a lot of uh, parties that don't always see eye to eye together, so there's an opportunity uh, to build on that if you are in a community that cares about this and you want to engage and that um, will lead into something like fisheries policy where environmental community conservation advocates and the fishing industry um, do not see eye to eye and there's even splits within the fishing industry. So the big news here is the uh, House Water, Oceans and Wildlife Subcommittee tomorrow is beginning a, a nationwide series of uh, listening sessions across the country. They're going to do two in the next couple of days, tomorrow as I mentioned and then uh, one on the 7th um, in San Francisco, and they're looking to schedule later in the year uh, in Seattle and then next year in four more regions, Alaska, New England, New England excuse me, the Mid-Atlantic and the Gulf uh, region. This is a, what they're going to do is, um, this is part of a process of reauthorizing or amending the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Act, which is the primary uh, uh, bill that governs how America's fisheries are managed. And as I again mentioned, climate change is something that they're going to work into this bill, which really has a big impact in terms of uh, stock shifting um, and trying to find the right 
water temperatures for, for their needs. So I, I would encourage folks to pay attention to this. Um, and there's also you know, ways that you all can participate. Uh, the first would be to host the listening session. Um, the, the session in San Francisco on Monday is gonna be at Aquarium of Bay. And so that has opened the eyes to the committee that is organizing this. Uh, these sessions. They, I know Seattle Aquarium is talking to them about trying to host the session there later this year. Um, and the Ocean Project is going to reach out to the committee and talk to them to try to figure out where they're looking to put these in the regions uh, that they're pursuing and try to match the locations uh, where there's an aquarium nearby. So hopefully uh, that works. Um, there's other ways to participate. Um, if appropriate, if you've got the expertise or the desire, these listening sessions are going to have uh, a small number of panelists, about five to seven uh, panelists, and um, um, and then they're going to go for about an hour or so getting their views and then open it up for public comments. So you could participate in either of those two ways. Um, if you're interested in doing this, um, the Ocean Project has been doing some visitor engagement projects on fisheries policy. Um, you can learn more about that on our website. There's a blog post which talks about uh, a second round of projects that just finished uh, and also um, a, pro a round of projects we did last year. Um, again, if you need more information on this, there's my email down at the bottom and please feel free to reach out to me. So, um, I want to introduce Colin Sheldon, who's going to talk about a couple of really important bills. Colin, just let me know when you need me to um, uh, move the slides. And if, if you've been paying attention to or if you've been attending our other webinars, you may remember Colin was talking about something called the WILD Act um, in one of our sessions earlier in the year. And um, I'm sure he would love to tell you about what happened with that at some point in his presentation. But I'll turn it over to Colin now. Thanks, Tom, and, and thanks a lot for inviting me to join you again. Um, I'm actually going to tee off with the WILD Act because um, legislatively it was a huge success for WCS and AZA. Uh, we got it attached on to Senator Murkowski's land package uh, early in this session, uh, and it passed and is now law. Uh, just to remind folks, the WILD Act reauthorized the Multinational Species Conservation Fund, which provides conservation grants for elephants, rhinos, tigers, great apes, and uh, marine turtles. And one of the key pieces of this was um, we added to the Marine Turtle Conservation Act freshwater turtles and tortoises. Uh, about 100 species of freshwater turtles and tortoises are all either threatened or endangered, uh, and a number of those species are actually already extinct in the wild and only exist in some of our facilities. Uh, so by expanding the Marine Turtle Conservation Act in uh, the lands package, uh, we're going to have a chance of getting some of those species back in the wild where they belong. Uh, so after every grand victory, and this was a victory several years in the making, uh, we then had to do what folks do after that, and that's figure out, well, well what, now what are we going to do? Um, so working with AZA partners and a number of other partners in wildlife uh, that we worked with to get the Wild Act passed, we tried to figure out, well, what should our new agenda be that has any chance of succeeding with a divided Congress and a... Um, I guess chaotic is the best word I can use to describe the administration, um, or at least the nicest word. Um, so recognizing the new and big ideas are, are probably not going to see the light of day, and I think Tom did a really good job of kind of explaining a lot of the uh, reasons why that is. We decided to focus on rejuvenating programs that would have a big benefit to wildlife, but not a huge price tag and not a big lift. So next slide, please. Oops. So... Hold on, the first Colin. one we decided to go to was uh, the Wild Bird Conservation Act. Um, is the okay. slide stuck? Yeah, there we there go. We go. Okay. So the Wild Bird Conservation Act uh, is originally a 1992 law that was passed unanimously by Congress. And the underlying law ensures that any trade in wild bird species in which the United States is involved is both biologically sustainable and to the benefit of the species. So. Uh, as a lot of folks are, will be familiar with, the illegal trade, pet trade, and the trade uh, for the ornamental parts of these species, uh, like scarlet macaws, African gray parrots, has been really devastating to, the, to, uh, to these animals. Uh, so the Wild Bird Conservation Act 
in nine, of 92 was intended to, to make sure the United States was not contributing to this. There was a piece of that law uh, that authorized a grant program similar to the multinational species funds intended to provide grants to conserve affected bird species in the wild. But somehow it, the, the program was created, but Congress never appropriated funds for it. So it just withered away. So the first thing we came up with was a bill that has since been introduced by Jeff Van Drew that simply reauthorizes that program. So once we can get this program reauthorized, we can go back to congressional appropriators and, and have them start putting money into this so that we can start conserving some of these species in the wild. Next slide, please. So back in 2009, the Appropriations Committee included a directive in the Interior Appropriations Bill uh, in the old parlance, we would refer to this as an earmark, but earmarks are not done anymore. So now it's a congressional directive. Um, so it, it, they created, they did two. Uh, and one was to support the conservation of rapidly declining amphibian species. And this gave rise to a program called the Amphibians in Decline Program, which some uh, zoos and aquariums participated in back when it ran. Ran about six years, funded 40 projects around the world. But unfortunately, when congressional budgets really got ratcheted back, uh, in the middle of the, the decade we're, we're currently going through, the program just dwindled away. It got folded into other programs at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the key problem here was there was no congressional authorization to keep it afloat. Um, and since the program uh, got wrapped up in other things, things have only gotten worse for amphibian species. The thing about amphibians is that the permeable skin they have makes them really vulnerable to environmental disturbances, to disease, pollution, gradual changes in temperature and climate and other environmental factors. Um, and with the rise of the chytrid fungus over the last several years, which infects the skin of these species, it, it's really caused a number of species, um, 90 species we now think uh, are now extinct in the wild because of chytrid, uh, and about 124 or so uh, from the last numbers that the uh, folks that work on amphibians at WCS have told me. Uh, 124 species have declined by more than 90% in the wild. And all of and the, the 90 that have been lost and the 124 species that have declined, this is all due just to chytrid fungus. Uh, in non-tropical climates where you have amphibians, um, there are other factors that have caused the decline there. So it's not just those numbers. So there's a huge need for this. So we got together with Congressman Hakeem Jeffries and Peter King um, to come up with a bill we have affectionately named the Salamander Act. Uh, and quite simply, it restarts the Amphibians in Decline program so that we, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service can start issuing grants again uh, to, for the conservation of, of some of these species in the wild. Next slide, please. So as with amphibians, appropriators in 2009 directed the Fish and Wildlife Service to provide grants to support the critically endangered animals more broadly. So if there wasn't already a multinational species program and you weren't covered by the amphibians program, the Critically Endangered Animals Conservation Fund was intended to get everybody else. Um, so for the six years this program ran, it supported 100 grants. Uh, everything from snow leopards and other big cats to African penguins. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a really successful program, but again, when budgets declined, there was no underlying congressional authorization to hold it together. So the third bill we came up with is H.R. 4341 and working with Congressman Jared Hoffman uh, and Congressman Vern Buchanan, uh, we came up with a bill that will create a new multinational species fund that will catch all the species that there isn't already a multinational species fund for. Uh, so the hope is that we will broaden those multinational species accounts uh, so that just about every species that is threatened and endangered, uh, there will be an opportunity for Fish and Wildlife Service to support uh, projects to conserve them. So we've already started to make some progress. Uh, the bills have been introduced in the House and the House Natural Resources Committee has already held a legislative hearing uh, on all three of these bills, which is kind of the first key step you need to go through to start your bill moving through the process. The next step would be for the committee to report them favorably um, to the House so that the House can take them up on the House floor. Uh, our ultimate goal is to bundle these all together uh, with another bill that a, a lot of folks uh, in the community are going to be familiar with, uh, the, um, the bill to renew the tiger stamp, the Save Vanishing Species Semi-Postal Stamp is another wildlife bill that we're working on, has also had its legislative hearing 
uh, it needs to be renewed is not currently on sale. And we're hoping to bundle that bill together with these three bills uh, and perhaps a handful of others. Uh, there's one I know with butter, dealing with monarch butterflies that they're looking to bundle in with this. Uh, and we're hoping to move them along in the process. And this is where uh, we could get some help. Um, all three bills need more House members co-sponsoring them from both parties. Uh, we have, um, I think we have less than a dozen on all three bills and we need to build the co-sponsorship um, to get enough critical mass, I think, to get these bills moving. So I encourage everybody who has an interest in this uh, to reach out to their members of Congress and ask them to co-sponsor these bills. Uh, and to that end, I'm happy to provide any additional information you might need. Uh, fact sheets are in the works that we'll, I'll be happy to circulate. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, uh, that folks might have. So I, again, I really appreciate the time to talk to you about these bills uh, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. You know, one thing that Colin mentioned is the bundling of these three bills and maybe one or two others together. Um, and when you're talking about, Congress is looking at sort of two, two uh, markers. The first is when they adjourn for the end of the year, between now and then, what can they get done? And it'll probably be sometime in December. Uh, and so bundling a few bills like this, although they've recently been introduced, is something that they're looking to do. As the clock ticks in the next year, they look at bundling even a larger package. And every now and then you'll hear about an omnibus parks bill or public lands bill and a wildlife bill. And so that's really, given what's happening on the House and Senate floor that I mentioned earlier, um, that's really, a, I think, a, a real possibility is some point uh, next year before the election, people are going to want to be able to say they did something uh, and they might pass a bill that's got an awful lot of this stuff in there. So um, Colin's request of, and suggestion of getting people to weigh in on these, uh, especially now, really can make a difference to build that momentum. So thank you, Colin. Um, and I, uh, we, uh, we will uh, po post the this web, uh, this uh, webinar on the Ocean Project's website, and I'll make sure I drop in Colin's email on his slides uh, if anybody is looking to follow up with him on that. So I um, want to finish out with a couple of things here about what's going on um, really on the bigger picture. Um, I touched on it a little bit earlier. I talked about uh, the oversight that's going on between the Natural Resources Committee and Interior. Um, if you think the Judiciary Committee is bad, when you watch them have hearings, you have never seen the Resources Committee. It's probably even worse in terms of the partisanship and, and the divide in there. And so uh, this oversight thing is going to really take on a partisan edge the deeper they get into it. Now, the committee is upset with not only some of the decisions being made to favor uh, the former clients of their senior officials, but also the suppression of science um, and particularly uh, climate change in, the, uh, in a few of its reports. Uh, this jives with something that happened this week you may have read about. The administration eliminated some science advisory panels uh, for oceans and lands, uh, two different ones for wildlife. Um, it sort of gives you a sense of what they, they're emphasizing and not emphasizing in the decision-making process. Um, as I said, these things are happening in, very, in many committees. It's also happening in the Commerce Department. Uh, which has oversight over NOAA and across the board. All of this uh, oversight and the battle between getting documents and witnesses and, uh, you know, the, the, the fight for headlines. I mean, it does create a bit of a drip, drip, drip that nothing's going on in here, uh, going on in Congress or in D.C. Uh, it, it adds to the whole impeachment thing. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what the effect of it's going to be, but it, it gives you the sense that gridlock is um, as bad as it's ever been. Um, that said, as Colin and I have mentioned already, there are things that will get done because um, they're around and there's things that are important to members. But this is something that's going to sort of impact all of it along the way. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about briefly is you see and hear a lot about the president signing executive orders uh, and proposed rules uh, that are rolling back environmental protections across the board, whether it's for wildlife, endangered species, uh, air, land, water, whatever. They're doing this all. Um, I will say that um, they're doing it in a hurry with haste and they're being sloppy and it's leaving lots of room for litigation. Uh, and um, 
there's already been a, a fair amount of success in at least slowing down these implementation of some of these actions. Uh, and so it is a bit of a time game, hopefully, uh, that uh, if there's a change in administrations, uh, you know, the, the Democratic administration in particular would drop a lot of these things and uh, withdraw them. Um, I just want to point out, um, if you look down at the bottom, uh, NRDC and Earth Justice, which are two of the bigger uh, environmental groups that play in the litigation field, have been doing very, very well in terms of their cases. So you see these photo opportunities uh, in the top right with the president, and it makes you feel like it's final. It's not, because then there's people in the bottom right at NRDC and other groups who are lawyers who are um, making a big difference right now. So um, all is not lost. All hope is not lost. So um, we're at the end here, and I just want to talk about a couple of things about what you can be doing and how you can cultivate uh, your members of Congress in particular, but these also apply to state legislators, uh, state officials, and, and your local government officials as well. Um, but in terms of the federal level, I'd encourage everybody to use the AZA Advocacy Day on May 20th next year as sort of a timeline target to put some things in play because it gives you an opportunity to build that up to a DC meeting, uh, which always makes a difference when real people, not lobbyists like Colin and I, real constituents, real voters um, come to town and meet with an office. It makes a much bigger impact. Um, and I know that there's some discussions about uh, uh, with AZA and the Government Affairs Committee um, of, of uh, making some structural changes to the program to try to make it uh, more effective and uh, more valuable use of your time. So I would encourage you to stay tuned for that. I'm sure there'll be an announcement coming out on that later. So um, I always tell people, try to get your members and their staff and or their families for VIP tours. Um, do not worry about if you can't get a federal person, get a, if you can get their district or state staff, they're the ones responsible for meeting with constituents and they're gonna have the, the members ears when they're traveling around the state. So it's just as valuable to get a state or district, just as valuable to get them as the DC staff. Um, when I was at Brookfield Zoo, we did this all the time. It worked really well in terms of cultivating relationships. Um, a lot of uh, institutions have special events around the holidays. I'd encourage you not just to invite your officials there, but if there's a way to incorporate them into the program, better chance of getting them there. Uh, and that begins to build that relationship. Um, if there's a, a, you know, you see here, this is a Woodland Park Zoo with uh, doing a press conference with their member of Congress. If there's a media event that you can do, um, that helps too because it gets attention to them. Um, it, it, uh, it sort of jumped ahead there. Let me back up and just talk about, I think the best way to present yourself is because you're trusted, you're science-based, and you're a valued member of the institution, uh, of the community, I would encourage you to focus on that, especially your role as educators of, you know, the hundreds of millions of people that come to zoos and aquariums every year. Um, obviously, you've got facilities that are great for venues, whether it's a press conference, staff meeting, some sort of public meeting they, that they want to do, uh, town hall meeting, whatever, you know, make sure you make that offer to them. Um, find reasons to thank them. They love to be thanked. Uh, they're kind of in the vanity business that way. Um, so even if, you know, they're not the greatest member in the world, if you can find something to thank them about, they love that. Um, and the other thing to do is give them an award and make sure it's something that looks good on a wall because they'll hang it in one of their offices and that makes you present even when you're not there. Um, even if you have to invent awards, that's one of my favorite things going back years. Uh, it's worked very, very well um, with members because they're, again, they're getting thanked uh, and it's a great way to build a relationship. So um, we are at the end here. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, sorry we ran just a couple minutes late. Um, I, I am happy to stick around and I see that there's some questions in the chat I'll try to get to. Um, but if you have any questions or uh, 
think comments you want to make, go into the chat box and that's where we'll be. Um, again, we need to thank the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for their support. A recording of the webinar will be posted in the next few days at theoceanproject.org. Uh, and uh, also PDF versions of these slides will be there as well. So thanks everybody. If you have to go, we we'll look forward to seeing you next month. And um, I'm gonna move over to the chat now uh, and try to answer some questions. Thanks again.